Hey, hockey fans, welcome to the Across the Pond Hockey Podcast YouTube channel. If it's your first time here and you'd like to support us, please hit that subscribe button and that like button. It goes a long way in helping us develop the program. Before we get to tonight's episode, I have to take a minute to thank our wonderful sponsors, starting with the China Hockey Group. The China Hockey Group is a family-oriented group of ice hockey leagues, training programs, and community initiatives geared towards developing hockey in Southeast Asia. From their incredible Junior Tigers program all the way up to the CIHL, which is Hong Kong's elite full-contact ice hockey league, they have a program suitable for players of all ages and abilities. You can also stop by the Warrior Bauer Hockey Shop in Central for all your equipment needs and skate sharpening. Check out their website for more information at ChinaHockeyGroup.com. That's ChinaHockeyGroup.com. Next, we have our friends at Accessory House Global. If you're like me and your headphones look like this, it's time to head to AccessoryHouseGlobal.com for any accessories you need for your headphones. From cables to carrying cases to new ear pads, they carry products for all the biggest brands. Head to their website at AccessoryHouseGlobal.com Use the promo code ATP20 for 20% off your purchase. That's AccessoryHouseGlobal.com. Next, we have our pals over at Wheel Hub Asia. These guys are committed to building community and bringing accessibility to inline hockey players across Southeast Asia. They're heading into the year two of Hong Kong's newest inline league, Three Inline. You can head to their website for all of your inline hockey needs at wheelhubasia.com, enter discount code ATP10 for 10% off your purchase. That's wheelhubasia.com. Next, we have our friends at Yardley Brothers Craft Brewery. Folks, if you're a craft brew fan and you're in Hong Kong, then you absolutely have to check out Yardley Brothers' incredible selection of award-winning brews. You can head to the Beer Shack on Lama Island, or the Yardley Brothers Cafe and Bistro at 62 Peel Street in Central. If you can't get out of the house, no problem. Just head to their website, yardleybrothers.hk, and you can get their delicious products delivered right to your door. That's yardleybrothers.hk. Last but not least, a huge thank you to Mr. Paul McLean at Sunset Studio in Kennedy Town for always making the podcast sound great. If you're looking for a place to jam with your band or record a new song, Check them out on Instagram at sunset underscore studio underscore HK. That's sunset underscore studio underscore HK. Folks, the websites and description will be in the description. All the discount codes will be there for you. Please check them out and support our wonderful sponsors. Hey, hockey fans. Welcome to Across the Pond, Hong Kong's first and only hockey podcast. I'm your host, Chris Ivany. And I'm here today with a very special guest. To say he's been around would be a huge understatement. This man has literally played hockey all around the world. He's played in 16 different countries from the US and Canada to England, Germany, Romania, and Australia, and a few stops in between. Uh, he's currently finds himself in Thailand coaching the national programs and U18 uh, programs. And uh, I just recently met him in uh, in November. It's real exciting to have him on the podcast here today, folks. Please welcome Mr. Rory Rollick. How are you, Rory? Hey, buddy. Thanks for having me. Hey, I'm excited to talk to you. I mean, uh, heard a lot about you, and I uh, got to meet you and see you in action. Uh, I can tell. I could tell right away you're a fierce competitor. Uh, you get your game face on when when the puck drops, and uh, and I love to see it. Um, so let's get right into it, Rory. Um, first of all, thanks for taking time to talk to me. I know this has been a little tricky. Our schedules have not lined up uh, as well as 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 we may have wished, but here we are. We're finally getting to chat, and uh, I'm excited to hear about your your career and uh, share with my listeners. So let's get started right away. Um, I know you grew up in a, in the Edmonton area. I don't know if exactly in the city. So tell me a little bit about where exactly you grew up and and your your family. Yeah, I grew up actually in uh, Gibbons, Alberta. It's like a little town, 3,000 people. You kind of mm -hmm. blink and and it, you're through the town. Uh, so I, gr I grew up there until I was about 13, uh, just played there. And uh, then I moved to the city uh, in Edmonton, uh, about Pee Wee age, and then uh, finished there in, until junior time and, and then 
that's when the, the journey began. Did, did, did your move to Edmonton coincide or have anything to do with hockey or was it a family move? Yeah, for sure. I mean, my dad worked in, worked in the city and, you know, we commuted there a lot just for, you know, go to the mall or something on the weekend, things yeah. like that. But uh, yeah, I mean, the, the hockey was great growing up, obviously small town, Canada, you're on the outdoor rink, you're, you're playing with all your buddies all the time. You just kind of go up together and, you know, you build that chemistry that you don't even realize obviously at that age. But yeah, um, you know, once we, once I got to that age, it was like, our town and another town kind of joined forces. So that's when, I, you know, the kind of the stuff started uh, yeah. going parents and, you know, the stuff that you weren't used to as much, you know, you're starting to get to that age too, where you understood a little bit of it. So, um, you know, around that time, actually, that was uh, probably a, a, you know, a really huge point looking back, you know, obviously again, you don't realize it, but um, you know, things could have really went the other way, but, uh, I actually played, um, on a selects team, Northern Alberta selects in the summer. And, uh, one of my friends, uh, Chris and Jock, I played with him throughout my career. Um, good friend to this day, but his dad was the coach in Edmonton. So he had seen me in the summer play with his son. So he wanted me to come to and play on his team in the city. So, um, you know, and it was a top team. So, you know, it was a big move to come from there and make that team and just kind of get right into the the city system. So right. that's kind of how it all started for me. Were you a multi-sport kid or were you pretty much focused on hockey? Yeah, I, I mean, I played roller hockey a lot. Um, to be honest, if like you could, uh, if there was like an NHL for roller hockey, I'd probably be there. Went that direction. Hall of Famer. Loved, you know, it was just dangling and four yeah. on four. It was fun, you know. Uh, so I actually had to stop that because it was losing too much weight in the summer when I was trying to put on the pounds back in the day. But um, yeah, I played that, you know, like junior high, you know, basketball, high school. They're always asking me because my height to play volleyball, yeah. stuff like that. But, you know, around that time, hockey's hockey's starting to get pretty serious. And, uh, you know, so that was that was kind of the main focus. But I always did other stuff like I, yeah. I was very active. So, um yeah, didn't didn't sit still too much. Well, you are a giant of a man. So <laughs> yeah. were you were you big like all throughout your teenage years, or was there a point where you just kind of spurred it? Yeah, I was yeah, I, I guess I was always bigger. I mean the 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 hard part was is like, you know, especially now it's like the, the hardest thing is like my size is like you'd be a monster in the NHL, even when like, you know, even before when I signed with New York, it was like, you're 189 pounds, 195, you know, just slowly going. But mm -hmm. it was like back then, 230, 240, like, you know, grown men, like these guys, it was just such a different time. So I was always big, but I was a late bloomer. It was a challenge to like, kind of put the weight on. And that's the thing. I was always pretty active. So was burning burning pretty much everything I was doing so uh but yeah I, I was a big guy and then you know you the filling out kind of took a little longer over time but uh you know if uh big guy now I guess <laughs> yeah so um I guess that leads me to ask like your style of play I honestly I haven't been able to, to watch you play I've seen some stuff online like very minimal um yeah. would you say that you were what would how would you describe your style i mean i was i was a very high kind of high risk high reward i went i i liked playing i i, I was a forward originally so i liked scoring i like you know i was big i could cut to the net i could use my body i i love sick handling and you know trying fancy moves and you know i was always watching the rock'em sock'ems and you know oh, yeah see see the peter forsberg one-hander like I mean, I did that my whole career being six, seven on the ice, so you know, you, for could, you. you could be on one side of the net. <laughs> yeah. So that, that was my thing, right? I was like, you know, fortunate, have pretty decent hands. Like I, you know, I could, I would go in the shootouts and, and things like that. And, you know, you, you were an offensive guy, but um, again, you know, it, like I liked hitting, I love blocking shots, like two yeah. on ones, but I, I liked that stuff. You know, I, I didn't, again, that, that was the, kind of the annoying thing was like we were extremely tough a lot of guys but you didn't fight right so it's like everything was just fighting it was like you know and again back then those guys like 
that was their job. They were professional. Right. Like, you know, I played with McIntyre, Bruger, all those guys. I, I talked to McIntyre uh, last month, you know, and yeah. like, I'm a big guy. I'm not fighting that guy. Right. Like that's a, well, that's you know, why that's I'm asking professional... because I mean, when you're yeah. 16, 17 years old, starting your junior career, yeah. were they being like, Hey dude, you got to oh. drop, you got to drop the mitts. Like you got to start taking yeah. care of business. And that's the thing, right? Like I, I love playing the game. It's like, I like being out there. I liked, I wanted to be on the power play, not right. fighting, playing five minutes. And, you know, so that, that was like, you know, I, I was offensive. I was yeah. offensive minded, but I liked the, like I said, the, the blocking shots, the hitting, you know, I loved hitting, but the only, again, the problem, as soon as you touch someone, you had four guys chasing you the, the yeah. rest of the night, you know? So it was like, you know, in Europe, it was a little more balanced. You could play physical and, you know, you didn't have every scrum after every whistle, things like that. But no, I, I just like, like playing. It was fun. It was like, I like trying being entertaining and, you know, it just enjoyed it. Like I, I loved the game. And, and like I said, you were just kind of caught up in it. So you weren't really yeah. thinking like where I came from. It wasn't like, I have to do this and this and this and this to make it. I was just kind of going through it and before you know it, you landed up somewhere. Yeah. So, right. So let's, let's touch on your uh, junior career a little bit. I mean, you got, you, you played a little bit of in the uh, Alberta junior hockey league, which I assume is the junior a, um, and then, um, medicine hat came calling and, uh, that's where you got your start. Tell mm -hmm. me a little bit about the medicine hat tigers. Well, that kind of happened. Like, so I signed with Camrose and uh, AJ yeah. and I was at like a, I think it was a spring camp, summer camp, something. And medicine hat was there and they seen me there. Mm -hmm. So they had invited me to camp. Cause it, so again, uh, my friend from earlier that I met messaged uh, Chris, uh, he was playing on the team. So it was like two buddies. We always talked about, can you imagine playing the WHL together? And like, so of course I get the invite. So I go to, I, I just went to camp as a walk on. I landed up making the team. Um, and then the team wasn't good. I wasn't like, they weren't really playing me that much. Uh, I mean, you'd get one shift here and there and, you know, and honestly, I didn't really real, like I said, I didn't really realize anything. I was just going through it. Right. And like my dad didn't go through it. He didn't, I wasn't getting advice from anybody. And, uh, I, there was a scout, I think it was Minnesota or, or something. I remember the jacket in the hallway and he came up to me and was like, Hey Rory, what's going on here? And I was like, you know, see that logo. Like, oh, cool. And yeah. <laughs> I'm like, what do you mean? I, I like, he's like, well, it's your draft. Like your draft year is coming up and you're not like, you're not playing, you know? And I just didn't even like, that's when I kind of first was like, okay, this, I mean, it sucked, but it was like, Oh, you were in the WHL just kind of shut up and you didn't say anything. Right. Yeah. So at that point, it was around Christmas time and they kind of talked with me and said, you know, you can stay here and kind of keep going through this or you can go back to Camrose. And uh, so I landed up going back to Camrose, um, which was absolutely amazing. Um, we landed up winning the Royal Bank Cup that year. Um, wow. And then uh, I actually signed with New York that year um, after Camrose. So you know, it was kind of one of those things like you weren't good enough to play in the dub and then you went and won a championship. And then after that, you signed a contract. So after that, I had to go back to Medicine Hat. And then it was it was a little awkward because yeah. the relationship, you know, it was like, how, how weren't you playing almost? And I again, you know, obviously there's a lot of stuff I didn't know, but um and then I got, I got, I landed up getting traded later on from there. But, and then I bounced around a little bit, nothing great. And then uh, I landed up uh, Sutter uh, in Red Deer traded for me. Um, and that was one of the great, that was the highlight for sure of the WHL for me. Um, playing in Red Deer, playing for him. Uh, you know, I probably wouldn't have. I probably wouldn't have went through the career I went through if I wouldn't have had that stop before. Um, to be honest, like, wow. uh, again, especially playing for him, uh, but just, just the whole run, you know, so many, uh, Roy Wick, Fanuf, all those guys I played with, you know, I still talk with those guys, you know, the odd time. And, um, yeah. you know, we had a lot of good players that went on to have really good careers. So 
that was a big year. You know, you were with big guys and you kind of got that real professional kind of NHL feel while you were in junior. So it kind of got you ready for that next step. And um, without that, I, I, I didn't get that feeling before, right. you know, so that was a good kind of send off. And, you know, I was able to go and, you know, do, do fairly well after that. But, you know, to be honest, I would have looked more at college hockey, especially being like kind of a late bloomer type guy, you'd have that more time. But again, I didn't know. And, you know, all that college stuff, once you play in the WHL and yeah, there's all that. So, you know, that, that's kind of how it all unfolded, but you know, I guess it, it worked out pretty good. And actually that year we, we lost to Kelowna in the finals. To I was going go to say, them. yeah, you guys played 23 games in the playoffs that year. So that, yeah. that's a pretty good run. Yeah. Like we, uh, yeah, we lost to Kelowna. I mean, Weber or like, you know, Duncan Keith, pretty good team, you know? So that, that was a, that was an amazing run I, that whole time. Um, but yeah, that was, like I said, that was a good, that, that whole run, you know, get slap was in Calgary, those type of guys. So, you know, it was, that was really, really good intense hockey kind of before you, your last year of junior, you know? So, right. um, cause like I said, before that, you know, it wasn't, it was, it, it was good, but it wasn't, it wasn't what it could have been, I think. Right. So you ended up, uh, like like you said, you got the opportunity to play for Sutter. You played with some great, oh. great teammates uh, in Red Deer. I had a great run in the playoffs. And at that point, what were your options? I mean, I know you mentioned college, and, and it's a hard thing for guys playing in, in major junior because afterwards, the last thing most of well, you... Well, I had my contract, so... Yeah. I signed, so then I was um, off to pro. You know, I could have... Yeah. Like you could have stayed for your um, overage year, but you couldn't because then like you lose your your contract or whatever. Right. So I went, and then again, it was it was New York, right? Yeah. Like, I mean, my mom saved a lot of my stuff, but even to this day, you know, you go home, like you look at those rosters. I remember like going to training camp, right? I mean, this is back in the, it was like going to the all-star game. Yeah. Yeah. You know, the, the biggest names in hockey were all in the same place. And then you, you know, you're looking and you're like, okay, there's 18 defensemen, 10 of them have NHL contracts. <laughs> and then it's like, you know, everyone has a chance this year. And you're like, yeah. oh, I, I don't think so. So, <laughs> I mean, it, it was, it was, it was tough. You know, it was a, uh, Again, there's you could go into the the deep political side. You know, there's so much who this yeah. and this. I mean, it's sports. It's you know things go the way they go. But um, you know, it was it was a it was a amazing organization in the sense. You know, it's it's the Rangers, but just the timing of it. You know, yeah. and and the and back then it was before the like the salary like all that stuff, right? So they were just. I mean, it was, it was, it was a tough line to crack and, you know, even in the American league, you'd come up and down and it was, you know, you'd be up there for three months and get bag skated for two and play two games or something. So, you know, it was a grind. It wasn't like, but again, you were, you were there. Right. So, yeah. I mean, that was, that was the dream to, to kind of get as high as you could. So um, again, just kind of going through it without the real understanding of how it actually is unfolding, right. you know, just kind of, kind of doing your best uh, without actually really knowing. That's interesting because, you know, and also like I've talked to a lot of guys that played, you know, had similar careers to you played in the E played in the A played in Europe, bounced around that kind of journeyman type stuff. And I, it's actually, it's what I prefer as an interview. I love talking to guys who just yeah. have had all these experiences. It's just, um, for you, when you when you got to the East Coast League, and at that time, the East Coast League, League is known as one of the toughest leagues. Like it's yeah. it's like a it's like a jungle, right? Yeah. That's that was kind of the perception of the league. What were your what were your thoughts on the league, and and what was it? What was the grind like playing in the East Coast? Yeah, I mean, especially that like that's the thing too, right? Like I I kind of played full circle. Like I played in the old. And then kind of the new, right? right. Like, okay. I mean, I was, I was, I think 32, 33, 34 or something playing in like Orlando or Atlanta or whatever. Right. So, mm -hmm. 
um it it was yeah, it, it was it was honestly really weird when you came back because you now you were like that man, right? Yeah. And then you look back when you were a kid, like, yeah, you were just running your mouth, thought you were tough, but like you didn't have that man strength. And like right. even if you were tough, like they were tough. Yeah. And then you came back and it was like this guy in front of the net, you just kind of grab him and move him, and you're like, Oh man, I'm that guy now, right? You're that guy. And but it was like you know it was good. Like it was, it was good hockey. Um, I think the biggest thing throughout that it was like, you know, obviously the higher the league, the less turnovers. And right. if you do make a turnover, it's probably in the back of your net. Right. And it kind of just goes like that. But then, you know, now the, the game changed, like I said, like later on, it was a lot more skating and offense. Like it was, it was kind of, to be honest, it was way more enjoyable to play. Right. I, 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 I would give anything to be able to do my career again with it like it is now, right. because, you know, it's like you can focus on the hockey side. Like even in the summer, you're training like I remember going home, like everyone, you got to take boxing. You got to get bought. Like yeah. I didn't want to take boxing. You know no. what I mean? I wanted to stick handle and like, go play roller hockey outside or, you know, lifting weights, stuff like that. But I, I'm like. I don't want to go do that. Like, that's just not my thing. So I think the focus now is more on the skill and the speed and, you know, the diet, the eating healthy, you know, before we were just crushing pasta and chicken and yeah. Alfredo sauce before a game and, you know, everyone's just getting jacked up. And it's yeah. like, it's, it was just so different, but, you know, especially back then it was like, it was more of a drop, right? Like, mm -hmm you're in it, you're at the NHL camp, you know, you're getting treated pretty great. Then you go down to Hartford, you're still playing in the civic center. You're in the nice locker room. Yeah. And then you drop down to the coast and you're like, Oh, uh, uh, uh. <laughs> and, but, but again, right. So then you're, we were in Charlotte. It's which was one of the best times, but it's, it's like, you almost, it's better if you're in a bad city because it right. probably motivates you to get out of there. Yeah. I mean, you know, you look at some of these guys and, you know, this and that, those guys in Wheeling and, you know, places like that, like, okay, I got to get out of here. You're living in Charlotte. You got your contract. You're like, ah, you know, you're playing and 8,000 people on the weekends. Yeah. And it was pretty cool, you know? So yeah. again, you get, you just kind of, you're there and you're just playing there and you're kind of almost forgetting about, okay, this is, this is just the start of the work I kind of need to do, you know, but again, everything's just going and, and before you know it, you know, maybe your contract's up or, you know, you're not getting called up and then, you know, the next step starts, you know, right. so. And back when you first started in the, in the coast, was there, was there, were there guys that made a career playing in the coast at that time? And compared to now where you, like you said, that talent levels obviously changed a lot but yeah guys seem to like be okay with playing a career in the east coast league now as yeah. compared well, to maybe when you were when you were there yeah i mean you got to remember the you know money stuff was different back then yeah. too you know there was more stuff going on or could be more stuff going on but like i mean it was it was kind of right on that point almost though, where the coast was kind of getting more about like the prospects, like the, it, it was more normal, right? Okay. Like before, if you were like a prospect and you got sent to the coast, it was like game over. Yeah. It was like, we, we had, we had a handful of guys and like good guys, guys that, you know, had good careers, played NHL, played American league, you know, all over Europe. So like good players, like there was about seven of them at the time when we were there. And that's kind of, you know, why it was a little fun. You had that group and we kind of went through those three years together, right? Like yeah. you were the bubble yeah. guys, you were the black aces when you went up. So mm -hmm. you were hanging out, you were having fun together, but you were going through the grind together too. Yeah. But it was, it was becoming more that, but later on it became even more that because I, I remember before I went to Europe one year, actually, I was, I was considering just doing an East Coast League contract. And uh, because I, I, I went to Europe and again, right, we didn't have iPhones. And 
we couldn't do video calls like this. You know, yeah. I was living in a village in the middle of nowhere with no internet. People are like, oh yeah, why'd you leave? It should have been fun. I was like, yeah. <laughs> it wasn't what you, yeah, you know, it's not yeah. whatever. It's, you guys just see the pictures of the, the good stuff, right? But it was yeah. like, I wanted to come back and it was like, I'm, you're 26. I was like, like that's like a veteran already right. since you start, you know? So again, right, you were almost pushed out to Europe a little bit sooner because it was starting to go more in the system and, and more younger guys kind of coming through and, you know, which is understandable. Like I, I went through it, you know, you're a power play guy or something. They're not going to play some guy that's, you know, making the bottom salary, doesn't have a contract over you. Even sometimes maybe he's good at it or something. Right. So it really started kind of changing, um, especially when I came back, obviously when I was like, there was, there was a lot of guys like uh, Orlando was Toronto's farm team. Right. So, I mean, there was about six, seven guys that had and it, like Maple Leaf contracts that were playing in the coast. Right. I mean, it's hard to keep, it's hard for me looking through your stats to remember who all these teams were affiliated with because they've yeah. changed so much oh, over yeah. the years, like especially oh, yeah. with the coast, even the AHL. I mean, yeah. every year there's teams changing around. Um, I just want to go back to one quick thing. You mentioned Daryl, you mentioned Sutter uh, as a coach, uh, somebody that really helped your career. Were there any other guys around that time that you looked to for advice or guys that you leaned on as a, as a mentor to help you you know, like, like you said, get started in your hockey career. You didn't have a dad that went through it. Were there, yeah. were there anyone else that you, you really leaned on? No. And uh, you know what, like, again, you don't want to, like, you don't want to say too much because you're, you know, there are people, right. Yeah. Obviously without you again, understanding fully, but I mean, that's the thing that I, I, I mean, that's the biggest thing that I think is, is the problem or like was the problem a little bit like, mm -hmm. I mean, that's really something I take for like my coaching because I like that side of it. Like I know how to be stern because of what I went through. I went through that. I know how to, you know, I know when it's time to yell or this or that, but I'm not just being that guy just for no reason. Right. And when someone does something good, I encourage them. I, you know, you, you go back and I tell them an old story or like there's, there's positive stuff there or like, you know, you tell them something and it's just like, this isn't just about hockey. It's life stuff for, yeah. you know, or, you know, like I said, just through my experience, all this stuff I'm telling them, it's, it's stuff that I'm like, guys talk all the time. They're like, Hey, we never heard anything like this. I wish I heard something like this yeah. because if, you know, it, it is very important. And, um, I think, I think that was a thing that was kind of missing with a lot of it is, it was almost like just shut up and don't say anything. And if like, if the coach like, like you know, if you were in his favor, like it was yeah. good. If not, it was like, you were just like it's scared to look at them. Right. Yeah. yeah. You were just like, I mean, it wasn't like, you know, I remember getting called up. It wasn't like, Hey, congrats. Good luck today. Right. It was like, you know, uh, should I, I feel like crawling under my stall right now. You yeah. Know? It was, it was just a different kind of a different way of, you know, obviously things were different, yeah. but um, so that was the hard part is like, you didn't actually like some of the stuff looking back and obviously it's easy when you look back, but it's like, you didn't almost like realize it while you were in it. Right. You know? And like, if you didn't have that guy and like, maybe it did happen, but it wasn't in the right way. Like it was like a casual, Hey, you should go, you should, not do that or something, you know, instead yeah. of like someone really just kind of sitting you down and, and helping you out or like, you know, seeing those people that again, the times were different, right? Yeah. How the lifestyle was different. Everything was different, but you know, the guys that were doing it the right way, you look back and you're like, I, you know, I wish I would have jumped on board with that or seen more of that or been around it more. Right. Yeah. And but again, no one, no one's fault. It was just more so kind of how the culture was, right? Yeah, and I mean, we, there's a, so much talk around hockey culture and culture in general changes for over sure. time and oh, it continues to sure. evolve. For but sure. and hockey's just one microcosm of that. Yeah. 
of that culture but hockey culture itself specifically has changed a lot and yeah. like you said uh, it was more of a keep your mouth shut show up unless yeah. you're unless you're one of the golden boys or one of well, you know that's what i was gonna say right like yeah. people people always look at like the perspective of like the guys that went through it Mm -hmm. Either it's like the horror story or like the first overall, right? Yeah, exactly. It's like kind of the middle people get forgotten about. It's like mm -hmm. there's a lot of people that go through like crazy stuff through here, you know. And then, you know, it's it's the guy that made it that just said, "Oh, yeah, I just had fun with it." It's like, no, you yeah. didn't. You did <laughs> no. a lot more than that. Hundred for hundred percent. I mean, you, you played know? a lot. You played. 340 games in the east coast league i mean that's yeah. where you spent a lot of your career um yeah. you did you did get uh called up to the ahl a few times played over 35 games there um talk about that jump a little bit uh i, I know you you mentioned like pucks end up in the back of the net but i mean overall in general just to give us an understanding of the difference how would you describe it yeah it was just like it was just it was war i mean it, it was just i mean that was like there was a lot of guys that were right on that, that ledge, you mm -hmm. know? And again, it was just like tough hockey. And I remember, you know, you'd play a Friday, Saturday, Sunday. And by that Sunday game, you're just. And, ice bag, ice bags. Yeah. And I, I, you know, I remember just looking through these rosters sometimes and, and the couple of the, the one year was like the lockout year. So I remember like, uh oh yeah i think it was like lowell back in the day that was carolina's uh farm team and i think the coach asked me before the game like to put me on the spot he's like hey how about the goalie tonight it was like my first game and i'm like uh -oh. who's the goalie who's the goalie and i looked it was like cam ward from <laughs> yeah. red deer right yeah and uh what is what's his weakness stuff like that i'm like I, I don't know. He was pretty good. Like, yeah, you know, shoot low, get him moving. I don't know. And like, just to kind of put you on the spot. And, and, and then I think he won the Stanley cup the next year and got con spice. So that's right. Uh, you know, just, just things like that. But it was, it was like really good hockey. Um, yeah. Again, it was just super physical uh, because again, right. Like back, like the hockey, the difference too now is most guys that would make it, if you're if you're a stud, you're a stud. If not, it was like usually that third or fourth flying guy that just went a mile, hundred miles an hour, hit, fight, get the crowd going, you know, chip in the odd goal, penalty kill. Yeah. Like those were the guys that were generally, you know, the utility guys that would go up unless you were a stud. So the American League was a lot of those guys. Like they again, they were really skilled. Like they could play hockey but they also had that, like that edge to them, that, that grit. So, right. I mean, it was a pretty intense league considering, you know, your one call up away from the NHL. And again, like just, just tough guy. Like I remember playing, you know, guys like Cam Jansen or something like that. Like that guy, that guy's dumping the puck and four checking you. And yeah, He's <laughs> just praying puck, it's not going in your yeah. corner. <laughs> the, the puck's the puck's been gone for eight sexes. He's still yeah. behind you. You know, yeah. you know, and they know you're a young kid. You're coming up. You know, with tall, long hair. You you stand out. You know what I mean? Like they yeah. know they're like I'm gonna I'm gonna make this guy's night miserable. But <laughs> yeah, um, but yeah, Hartford was, and then I I got an opportunity in Binghamton um, mm -hmm. with Ottawa. They were Ottawa's team, and um, so I went up there and. I was there for like five months and that, that was a good experience. I mean, it was mid season. I was living in a hotel, um, you know, one of those type lifestyles. It was like, it was great, but not great. But um, again, you were right there and, and I got an opportunity to play. Um, so it, you know, it was good. It was obviously, you know, to be able to make that level, yeah at, uh, you know at that time any anyone who plays a game there like you know that's a good job right it's, absolutely it's, it's it's tough work and it, it's tough to get there so um obviously would have been nice to you know play a longer time there but I, again it was just it was a different style of hockey um it was again well so whatever, many, you know so systems, many things different system everything yeah. right I mean, there's so many things go on yeah have yeah. to go right 
yeah. for someone to play in the NHL. Um, yeah. I mean, take yourself and and all the guys you played with and all your buddies and, you know, a guy like you has played 400 games in the coast in the AHL. I mean, what would you say the, the main factors or the difference from someone like you who obviously you probably had the skill, the size, but there's so many other small factors timing coaching right situation yeah. right time um attitude uh, sure. work, work ethic whatever it is like what what do you think is the thing that gets people over the edge i mean obviously like the consistency is a really big one i i mean uh that's like the funny thing is is like i i live more like a pro now like you live like the perfect way right now and that's yeah. it's, it's almost frustrating because you're like ah this is it this is yeah. what this is what they meant or this is this right yeah. you're in the gym every day you're stretching you're doing stuff and it's like I'm, I'm coaching now but you're you know you're not going out party you, you know you're just living a, a better life kind yeah. of thing and again that's just maturing and you know kind of going through stuff but that consistency thing is a big thing obviously you know attitude all this stuff again you're just thrown into this fire of all these people and personalities. And, you know, you, you don't even know how to be almost right. Like yeah, you're, nice. you're a kid, you're young. And again, you sign a contract and then you get this money and then you're just getting to that age where you're meeting girls and you're yeah. moving away from home and you're just all of a sudden, boom, you're, you're in it or you're with this group of friends or they're going and they're doing like you, I mean, that's the biggest thing, right? Is right. I think that the, the ones that can kind of stay in their lane and they're really focused, obviously, on, on kind of what they're doing, I think that goes such a long way, obviously, with anything, right? Because at the end of the day, like life is just endless distractions and, and noise all around you every day, right? I mean just going to the gym or something like that. There's a yeah. hundred other lazy things you could do or something. Right. So, I mean, the guys that really focus on that. And I think, I think knowing that at a young age, like that's the thing I, you know, obviously the culture here is a lot different, but I really just push for, tr you know, trying to keep that consistency and yeah. getting better every practice and actually working on things like, Oh, my shot's not good. So don't work on your skating all the time and never your yeah, shot, right? So. Kind of just like understanding stuff, you know, just going on the ice and shooting pucks maybe before or after practice mm -hmm. and just all those little things. But again, like you said, if someone likes you, awesome. Yeah. And if someone doesn't like you, which again, right? Yeah. People don't realize that happens more often than the ones yeah. liking you. Yeah. And then, you know, you have one guy, maybe he's jealous, maybe he doesn't like you, maybe he had a bad day and, or, you know, people are just like that. You walk in and someone doesn't like you and that person's in control of your next step. Yeah. That's tough. I mean, yeah. Right. Like, I know. I, I mean, like that that's the thing like people oversee, right? Like, again, it's easy to sit back and kind of like attack yourself if you want Like, Oh, I should have done this, should have done this. But at the same time, you're like, I could have done the exact same thing, but yeah. went to San Jose and this guy liked me and like, who, who knows? Right. You don't know. Right. So, I mean, that's, that's definitely a big thing though, is just like overall, like the consistency on and off the ice, like just, you know, like they say, be a pro. Yeah. It's a really good point. And I mean, I've talked to guys, like I said, like take a guy like Steven Dixon or Stu McRae, who like you played in the East coast, jumped up and played a few games in the AHL here and there and ended up playing in Europe. But they always, they all said the same thing as well. Like you got to show up whether you're hurt or you've got a yeah. sore leg or you, you know, you're, you're you got a bruised rib or a headache. It didn't yeah. matter. You had no. to be a pro every single day. And yeah. those were the only guys that were able yeah. to have those kind of long careers. And, and, when I, and I that's think the thing you were doing. And that's the thing. It's like, think of all the stuff you actually were doing, right? It's easy yeah. to pick the stuff or focus after like the things you didn't, but you're like, man, yeah. I would like, you dedicated your whole life to it or something. So yeah. it's like, I mean, you were doing, so much but again there was like like you said earlier like it's a fine line right mm. and some guys do less and go further and yeah. some guys do more and don't so 
I mean, that's yeah. that's the way it goes. There's but no per- here, there's no here perfect, we are. <laughs> there's no perfect recipe. No. I mean, it no. doesn't matter where you're from, where you live, no. where you grew no. up, whatever. Um, and yeah, that consistency. When I think back to my childhood, and like you know, I played a high level of hockey most of my life. You know, AAA yeah. hockey, high school, and a little bit of junior B. And I I always just think back of like there was always that one kid who on Friday night was home, you know, shooting shooting pucks in his backyard. And we were out running, we were out running the roads looking for girls or getting in trouble or building cabins or whatever we were doing. But it's that, that consistency, I think really starts at a young age. Yeah. And I, I remember doing that. Like I remember like Cam Neely was my favorite player. The Bruins would come to Edmonton like once a year and Neely would never play because his knees all the time, but I would get, Chris for Christmas, I would get a ticket for the game, Boston yeah. Edmonton. Yeah. And we would we had a practice, just practice, regular, you know, what is it, Bantam Age practice? And yeah. I missed the game just to go to the practice. And the worst part, the rink we would practice at was across the street from us. So we we're <laughs> literally just like rubbing your face in it. But like right. Again, you know, high school dances or something. Yeah. I was home at 10 o'clock. I knew I knew the coach wasn't going to call me. I probably could have got away with it. But I like I was there. I was at home. You know, you miss you miss a lot of stuff. Like looking back, like tons of stuff. I mean, even as you get older, friends and wedding or whatever. Right. But yeah. it's like that was part of it. Like you had to do that. And if you didn't do that. That was it at that age. Right. Because. That that's something I think it's hard to like learn later. It is. It is. Right? It's either something like, you either have because yeah. like I was. That's where we differ. Like I was the guy that went to the dance. You know? Yeah. Um, yeah. Um. And like at, at that point, and I know like these things start at a young age. But is there guys that can flick the switch? And be like, okay, I'll, I have a chance here. I'm gonna turn yeah. my life around, and I'm gonna dedicate everything, every second of every day to hockey. Have you seen things like that, or is it more like guys that just had that? Yeah, it was more just like the guys that, and and that's, I mean, that's the difference even with the cultures, right? Like I, like sometimes I'm doing something or you're coaching and like in your brain or you're feeling like I, you have this demand, but it's like, you're not going to get that from the majority of the kids here, right? Like that's not like we were in minus 30 on an outdoor rink, you know what I mean? Like. Yeah, it, it sounds cliche, but it's like you actually were doing that. Like that was something you were doing. And because it was just like kind of ingrained in you, it was um, just like battling through stuff. Like you said, like, yeah. you know, you you go home at night, the room's spinning. You didn't call the team trainer like, hey, I don't feel well. <laughs> it was like, you know, like, oh, yeah. I got a game tomorrow. Hopefully this goes away. So yeah. it's just, yeah, I mean, it's just different, right? Right. Okay. So let's get back to your career a little bit. Um, let's start, let's pick up from where you, where you talked about being in Binghamton, your chance with, with the baby sends. Um, after that, you seems like you kind of career shifted a little bit. You decided to yeah. head overseas. So I, I think the year after that I signed, uh, it was like a three way, like San Jose, Worcester, Phoenix. Mm-hmm. Yeah, um, the road runners yeah and then i went to worcester camp and you know had a good camp but then you know the same repeat message good job numbers yeah <laughs> it was always numbers the same meeting for the eight years straight yeah. um and then i went i went to phoenix and you know phoenix worcester couldn't be further apart from a ideal call-up situation place right. and um I think I had in my contract, I think it was like, I had like 10 games or something supposed to be like guaranteed. Um, and then I, I separate my shoulder earlier in the year, I think. So I missed a little bit of time. And then, um, it was getting around like Christmas time. And I was just like, like even playing in Phoenix, like it sounds cool, but Mm -hmm. if you were playing for the coyotes, (laughs) you know, you're, you're living like an hour outside of Scottsdale it's like even if you went there you can't afford to buy anything um so it was just kind of like you know no fans really at the game it was it it wasn't the best so um it was kind of at that point where I was 
it, it was actually funny because it, it's a true story. I, I was, I was having this thought and I went to the grocery store and I was walking and I was just like miserable. I'm like, I don't, I don't, I don't want to play here anymore. Like yeah. this isn't, I don't, in, I'm not enjoying this. Like there's four months left of the season. Nothing's happening. You're going to go home at the summer and, and what? Right. So yeah. I was walking home from the grocery store and I, I was thinking of this. I called my dad. I just told my dad and I went home. I opened Facebook and I had a message from a team in, uh, in Germany. And literally right wow. there, I was like, yeah, okay. Called my agent and said, I'm going to, I'm going to take off. So I think probably five days later, I, I drove back from, from Phoenix and then I landed up going out to Germany and, uh, and then I just, yeah, I landed up staying out there. And then again, just, I did, I did a like I did great out there. Yeah. Uh, uh, you know, the hockey was my style, the fan, like everything was great. Um, but again, right. You, you get that like people, Oh, you quit, you left the team or this and that it's, you know, like people don't understand what's going on. It's right. like, you're, you're a bad teammate or this, they're like, no, this team hasn't paid me in four months. Right. Like, you know, there was a lot of things, like a lot of things went into that minor, the minors, right? Like, especially in Europe, like a lot of stuff, you know, you're, they call you high maintenance because you asked for an oven in your apartment. <laughs> you know, like, oh, yeah. this guy's asking for an oven. It's Who's like, oh, think well, he, he needs everything. I'm like, no, I just want to cook some chicken for, for free game or something, you know, yeah, but yeah. like, supposed to have a car don't have a car you're supposed to have internet don't, you know like there's a lot of things so mm -hmm. but again the money was good back in the day the exchange rate it was tax-free you know you got a car a place obviously like i said you know a lot of things weren't normally set up the way they were supposed to be yeah. when you you initially got there but again it was like it, that was just part of the grind it was part of the journey it was the love of the game it was like you just went through it it was mm -hmm. like if I have to sleep on this couch for a month <laughs> while I'm waiting for my bed, but I get a play here, I, I'm going to sleep in. on the couch, yeah. right? So, 100%. It, you know, a lot of great things. You seem to always have put up good offensive numbers as a defenseman. I mean, half a point a game in the, in the coast is nothing to shake a stick at. And and obviously your numbers, when you went over to Europe, your numbers got better and you were, you were scoring more and getting more opportunities. But from the perspective of like, the pressure that was involved in playing in a system you're if you're in the coast then you're part of, of a professional organization somewhere mm -hmm. somewhere in, in that in that you know spectrum mm -hmm. but you're when you decided to move over there was that pressure kind of lifted to the point where like now I, i'm not going to play in the nhl chances are i'm not going to play in the nhl so i'm going to go over here i'm going to get back to playing the game i love kind of was there a weight off your shoulders or was it like were you more, were you more angry and pissed off that you weren't playing in the NHL? Um, it was, it was actually, I mean, from a pressure standpoint, it was like almost more pressure because you were an okay. import. Okay. So, I mean, you were coming in there, right. And then like any, you had a contract, you, you know, you have pretty decent numbers. So there's that expectation, like again, right. I didn't show up as this guy's just going to play defense. Like we're expecting you to, to help be the win. power play guy. Yeah. Get points, play defense, this, this, you know, kind of, kind of everything. Right. And I, that was an imports kind of role right i mean especially when you would go down to like you know a second division or something the second league maybe you have more pressure um but again i i fed off that like i i love the fans like i like being the love hate guy i yeah. i would wink at the fans on the road you know to get them going it's like yeah. that, that was fun for me but it was like again you know like the game's like so much of what I like how I was is like normal in this game, right? How it is now. But back then it was, it was, it wasn't as much like that. Right. But it was like, yeah, you're, you're there's fans, there's interaction. It was like, you're, you're not in the NHL. Like yeah. you're, you're playing, you're going to, you know, and that's what was great with Europe. The fans were incredible, you know, 3000 fans sounded like 10,000 some nights. And yeah. Um, but it was, 
I mean, the pressure was always there at any stage, just because the sense of, I mean, I mean, especially once you did get to that point, I guess, where you thought, you know, okay, the NHL, the AHL, that's not going to happen now. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, financially, the East Coast wasn't where you wanted to be as you were getting older. Mm -hmm. So, you know, Europe made more sense for, you know, and then even maybe if, you know, a lot of guys I know would find a spot and stay there for five years or something. Mm -hmm. um, but for me, I kind of used it too, where, okay, I'm going to see the world. I'm going to go play in like, and again, that's like a, a bad thing too, right? You, you play in all these places. People are so quick to judge like, oh, they didn't want him here. You didn't want, like, no, I went there for a year. I checked it out. It was good. I had my time. And then next year, I'm going to go try another place. Like, it wasn't always like, or again, right? It's, it's, you, you have to think about other things. Yeah. It's, it's not like you're making a couple million and you can just stay in this nice city for the next eight years. Like, mm -hmm. you know, things changed constantly. Mm -hmm. And again, you're, you're getting older. So, I, the pressure of like, I gotta, I gotta do what I gotta do to keep this going. Yeah. So, you know, later on, even if it's like, okay, hey, you're, you know, like when I went to Orlando, I wasn't on the power play. Obviously I love being on the power play. I want to be on the power play, but it wasn't even a bother because right. I was on the PK. I was older. I was eating shots. These young skilled guys were patrolling the blue line and I was having fun watching them and everything was great. When you were young, you didn't have that right. mindset or understanding of kind of playing a certain role. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, it, it was always, it was just kind of different pressures kind of throughout. Right. But it was, it was always there. And if it wasn't from the fan, it was your own brain kind of putting the pressure on yourself to, you know, perform or keep the thing going. Right. And I want to go back to something you said, because I thought it was really important for people like me who are researching players like you. And we look at your stats and we look at your hockey DB page and there's 25 teams and, and, you know, sometimes two and three in a year. And you start to think like, what's going on here? Yeah. But there's so many factors, like you said, and we need to understand that, you know, as, as fans of the game and people who follow, follow hockey around the world, it's, there's yeah. so many other, so many other little things involved. It's not just all about your teammates and, and, and no. money and, 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 and especially back then, right? Like yeah. if I had all this technology, like, <laughs> yeah. I, I mean, you know what I mean? Like yeah. you can call your parent, you can, your buddies that like, like I said, I, I, the one year in, in Germany, I literally didn't have internet. I was living in a village. Like I would walk half an hour with coins and I would go to an internet cafe and I'd put coins in this and yeah. I would sit there and go and like uh, check my email. And it was like 10 hour time difference. So no one was online to talk to you. Yeah. And it, again, right. It was just, it was easier to be homesick. It was easier to miss things. Mm -hmm. It was easier, you know, like even you could order things. I had a MacBook and like the internet didn't even connect to MacBooks back then. Like, you know, just, just things right. you wouldn't even think wouldn't of, right? Even like think of that, no. Like now you have your phone. As soon as you land, you're halfway across the world. You're like, hey, mom, hey, dad, like, yeah. what's up? You don't, you don't feel like that, you know, it was such a different time. So I think even in that sense, obviously it would have made it a lot easier, but um, yeah, that's, that, that was part of the... <laughs> part of the experience part of the like, fun yeah. yeah so yeah. of all the places i mean we okay we can't go through every stop you made but i mean of all the places you were in europe um couple stories maybe or a couple highlights uh, of places you played yeah i mean uh like germany uh, yeah i had some really good times just with like I, again with like the fans like i you know i got along with the fans that did some great teams like uh, like Cabina Fest, they were called, you know, after practice once a month, every, one guy buys all the food and the beer and you just have a party in the room. And usually that goes somewhere into the city. And, yeah. Um, you know, just, just uh, like looking back, like 
I'm just everything. Like that's what you miss. Just laughing in the locker room with all the guys and just being idiots and doing stupid stuff and telling stories. And, um, you know, Romania, we had such a great group and, uh, we won a championship there and, you know, just the parties through the city and taking the cups into the bars you'd go to and, and, you know, just meeting all the people and all the fans and, and seeing the, like I said, playing all those different ranks and, and seeing the world. And, um, you know, even to this day, you still talk with old fans or they'll, they'll send a picture. They're still rocking your Jersey at the game yeah. or, uh, yeah. you know, someone sees it. Like, I mean, that's the, you know, that's the stuff my dad always said too, right? Like, you know, these guys that make the NHL for sure. Great. But it's like, you're in that league, you know, mm -hmm. the guys yeah. that did this, like you had to go. And I mean, you think of, I, I feel like I could write 10 books on, on the stories. You of, should, you know, when, when I look at every, that's kind of how I, I remember my life. I'll go. And sometimes I have to look up my own stats where I played and what year and be like, Oh, that happened that year, that year, that year. Cause I mean, there, there was, there was just so many, uh, so many cool experiences. Again, a lot of, a lot of like tough stuff, but I mean, in, in Germany going Oktoberfest and carnival. And mm -hmm. I mean, there were like, there, there was never an excuse. The bars were open until six, six in the morning. So you could never be like, ah, it's too late. <laughs> guys, guys that get home, it's from the road. It's 2 a.m. Yeah. Uh, we, we got four more hours. So, but no, it was, it was fun. Like, but yeah, I mean, the, playing in the States, like that was a lot of awesome arenas. And honestly, like Orlando was one of the best. Um, that was such a good, recharge i mean i was i was older then and yeah. i wanted to keep playing and you know things lined up my old equipment manager from charlotte they were looking for a veteran guy and uh i mean that was one of the best like looking back you're like if, if i i i could i could play eight years there or something right. you know if you, if you had that good rock star contract or something but yeah. i mean just some awesome places you know you got to live you know, even being from Canada, getting to live in those warm climates, uh, mm -hmm. a lot of my career, you know, even being in Charlotte when you're, you know, you're 20 years old and you're going to an NFL game during Christmas and it's warm out, to, yeah. you know, just all that stuff made, made that all cool, you know. Yeah, I'm sure you got a million stories. We would need uh, we would need oh. about ten episodes to get through. Oh yeah, oh yeah. <laughs> I do want to ask you about Australia because. Um, I don't know if you know um, Kerry Goulet. Uh, yeah. So yeah. Kerry, like you, played all over the world. Uh, he's part of. He was part of the. I don't know what the name of the event is that they have in in Australia. Um, and Wayne Gretzky was involved one year. Yeah. Uh, going down there. I mean, what is hockey like? Because I have a million stories from Europe, but what is hockey like in Australia? Um. It wasn't. It wasn't bad actually. Um. Again, it was, it was one of those things, like it was after one of my seasons. I, I, again, I was older. It would have been more enjoyable, I think younger. Yeah. Um, but I came home and I just finished the season. I think I played in three places that year too. I was just yeah. beat. I remember I was laying on you the did. couch. I was just dead. <laughs> I just drove home from Atlanta, like 30 hour, you know, in two days, three days, whatever. And I'm like, I'm, I'm done. Like I, I need to take a break. And then a guy, old guy played against called me. Hey, Rawls, do you want to come to Australia and play? And I'm like, I just got no chance. Yeah. And I think eight days later I was like, all right, let's go check it out. So I flew down there and um, like the, the guys on my team, like the import, uh, like one of them played, in like Hungary and like the mole league and, mm -hmm. you know, and, and other two guys were like, I think pretty decent, like OHL guys. Yeah. Um, and then I, there was a couple teams. I, again, it's one of those, like you, you know, like Melbourne has their team cause they have guys that have their dual citizenships. Right. So then you have those more stacked teams that have guys that married and live out there. And, um, but there was actually, I mean, it was, 
it was uh it was a lot better than I thought. Again, one of the it's one of those leagues that just kind of I think gets better every year. Right. You know, it's one of those like you hear stories from the guy that like brought me over there where you know, guys getting 50 points in 10 games or something, right? So then you're coming there and you're thinking, oh, and then but I mean, it was it was decent hockey. But again, right, like where we played, there was no glass. It was a rink in the mall. It had mesh. You, you know, you're not playing the same yeah. hockey. You're not you're not going to that. Ex- but you kind like once it gets intense. And I mean, there's there's some tough guys like there's, you know, those Australian guys that, you know, they have their own beefs and rival like that's their league. So, you know, yeah. they have their own. Uh, guys they they dislike and um but it it was it was fun like it was it was kind of it was like I said a little better than I expected but it was cool because you would fly to like Melbourne you'd play stay for the weekend so you could you know you'd get to go out maybe see the city one night and then you'd go home the next weekend go to a different city the next weekend so you got to kind of see the country um so it wasn't bad. They put a little all-star game on, which is, mm-hmm. you know, fun, a little skills competition. Yeah. And, and uh, but again, it, it's just more so it's one of those word of mouth leagues. Like right. if guys bring guys, it'll be good and get better. Mm-hmm. And, you know, maybe in 20 years with these guys that are living out there and having kids. Um, right. Actually, one guy I, I uh, met at, at the all-star game, uh, he, uh, he lives out there and, a Canadian guy and he's, he's running all the programs and stuff. So again, right. Like you, you get these guys set up in these places, kind of mm-hmm. like how I am here Yeah. over time, you know, that's kind of the goal, I guess is to, but again, there's, there's just that gap of what's coming. Right. I guess. I mean, the to me, it, to me, it's fascinating. The more I'm over here and the more I'm seeing the little stories, the reason I started the podcast was hearing stories like yours, like, so many people that the game is spreading so much and it's it's yeah. become such a global sport now we see it growing here in asia to see it growing in australia like this kind of stuff like warms my heart like i love yeah it's these awesome stories and i love hearing about you know guys like you who've, who've done this and, and have been around for a long long time so uh, honestly dude congratulations on an incredible career you've got to see so much throughout your career and experience so much um just yeah congratulations on all of that thank and, you i appreciate and, that and um and now you're you're in a position um where you probably never thought you'd ever be i <laughs> mean you're in bangkok you're running the u18 national program you're coaching the women's team you're involved with the men's national team mm-hmm. um first of all how did it happen and and how do you feel about it like you've only been there a short time now how has how has your experience been so far? Um, so how it happened was I was actually in China. Mm-hmm. Um, I was going to do some coaching out there, and then the whole COVID thing happened. But you know, long story short, one of the guys knew who I was in China. He had seen me. He came to Thailand to build the the brand new ice rinks. And so he was connected, obviously, with my current boss, who's who's did the rinks. And, uh, you know, he was looking for he wanted like a real professional to come and actually, you know, teach his kids, teach the game. And uh, so I kind of got connected with him. And, uh, you know, again, it was the whole COVID stuff. It was a nightmare when I first came out here and got locked up and crazy stories and all those COVID tests and, and nonsense. But. Um, you know, I was here while it was an empty field still, right. and now, you know, it's, it's up and running and, um, and then I played in the tournament and some guy slammed into my knee and I blew my ACL. Um, so, uh, you know, went my whole career with, you know, I had face and shoulder, but never my knees that mm-hmm. I blow my knee out in Bangkok. And, uh, so I've been, you know, recovering and, battling through that and and still doing everything but um so that's basically it just kind of all I came from that and then uh I I was I was gonna do maybe less to start and then once I was here um 
you know, the hockey obviously needed a, lo a lot of fixing and, 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 and things. So um, I was able to, you know, be put in, in the right time when things were kind of, okay, we need something to get going here. So I stepped in and uh, um, you know, I have a handful of other coaches here um, that work, you know, do private stuff and, and handle kind of more of the younger, the younger uh, groups. And, uh, and then they'll, they'll do more private stuff. And then again, like you had said, all the teams. So I'll work directly with, with those groups. And uh, so, yeah, I've been, been doing that. And uh, yeah, it's, it's been, uh, it's been a wild, uh, like I say, it's been a great time here, but it's mm -hmm. been a lot going on obviously yeah. with, with everything, but um, yeah, it's, 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 I'm, I'm really happy and I'm here and it, you know, I think we're going in a good direction right now. That's really good to hear, man. And um, I want to know like, what is, I, I've already talked to someone who's coached in Thailand. Uh, I guess the pre the, what would you call him? The guy who coached before you. Okay. Um, what are some of the challenges that you like uh, be, take away the, the hockey culture? We all know it's different. We all yeah. know that you don't have a lot of ice times and expensive and equipment is hard to come by, but like, what's the biggest kind of mental hurdle you have to get over to coach in a community or a city like this where hockey is not really understood? Yeah. I mean, the, yeah, it, it's crazy. Like, you know, again, people don't, I'm driving a motorbike, yeah. And, like, you know you're risking your life three times a day <laughs> yeah. you know so, so sometimes i'm actually thinking about what i'm doing there's trucks ripping by me and i'm like i'm going to the rink right now like yeah. this is crazy but i mean again yeah there's a lot of stuff that goes into it but um i i think the biggest thing is is uh the the, the mindset like the mentality that because everything kind of comes back to that. So, um, you know, again, like you said, like you touched on, you know, obviously Thailand uh, hockey in a place like Thailand, typically more of a niche group, more, you know, maybe a wealthier people or, you know, things that like, again, affording equipment and getting stuff here, the access, like, you know, sometimes like, oh, I need, I need weight, 108 laces and, yeah, you know, yeah. you, you ain't getting them right <laughs> yeah. so you know just things that you want to like me getting my new skates it's been like 10 months I've, I've, you know it's just been a nightmare you know those things that are typically easy especially you know someone that you know if you you played at a decent level or professionally you were around more maybe convenience you know and then it's kind of the opposite and uh but i mean my biggest thing was just like with everything, right? You have all these private lessons, you have a lot of these skills stuff, you have a lot of this, but it's like, you need to understand why you're doing it and what the actual game is and what the actual sport is. And like, you know, being able to teach these, like, I mean, hockey's a, I've done it my whole life. It's everything to me. So to be able to teach these kids that would like have never heard this, or got this advice and like been shown this from someone else. Right. So like to be able to have the experiences that I've had and be able to like bring them to a place like this. Yeah. It, it makes for a bigger jump than, you know, someone that didn't maybe experience that. And, and that's where like, you know, I'm, I'm fortunate that I get to do this with, with this group because it's all kind of new. So it's exciting, but it's mm -hmm. extremely frustrating because yeah. like, you know, this, there's sometimes in practice, you're just standing there and just chewing on my whistle. Like, ah, how did you not see that? Or how did you right. not pass? Like, you're just thinking, yeah. but again, right. It's it doesn't like, come natural. It's not no, coming natural no, to them. No. And, yeah. and that's, like I said, you know, to you earlier, just me saying, Hey guys, we need to go low to high. Like, but yeah, the, that's another dimension. And now like right. I'm on the bench, low to high, low to high. And you see that kid passing it, they go D to D and they're shooting. It's like, yeah, I know. It's amazing. You know, like cool that's, feeling. What's, that's what's cool. Cause like, yeah, again, that's what hockey is. Like when we're doing stuff, like sometimes I'll do a drill or like, you know, a private session, but it's like, it doesn't look the fanciest, 
but it's like, this is real hockey. Like this is what you're going to be doing in a game. Right. And you know, when you, when they start understanding that, that's where you see them excel too. And, and a big thing with, you know, the Asian hockey, like coming here, basically it's like shinny with whoever the best player is and the best goalie. Mm -hmm. So we got three kids playing, eight kids watching that like, it's very, you know, so now that, like I said, I'm teaching the game and you're actually breaking it down. and, And these kids that maybe didn't, weren't as valuable or didn't feel they had a role before because they weren't able to fly coast to coast and deke everyone out. Right. Now these kids are valuable. Right. And even for these parents, it's a big change in culture too, because right. It, usually the goal scorers get the praise and like yeah, people don't even, no one's cheering about a block shot because they don't even like, right. It's right. Good so point. now that these kids are actually learning, like I said, you know, you're a third line guy and you're blocking shots and not getting scored on and you get the odd goal. Like, you're doing it like you're more valuable now than when you were trying to be that guy. Hundred percent. Yeah. So so now like way more kids are are valuable, and you're able to work with them. You know, touching back on you know what we talked earlier is just like kind of understanding your role, right? Like I might think I'm a goal scorer, but currently to play on this team, I'm not going to be that goal right. scorer. So right. if I want to be here, I'm going to be, I'm going to do this job and I'm going to do it the best I can. Mm-hmm. And then now, you know, you might have a parent like, well, why that my kid's better than that kid. But it's like, not really. You just yeah. don't see it in the hockey s- side of it. Right. Yeah. So being effective in other ways. Yeah. And then I, I, like that's how you got to grow things, right? Yeah, because absolutely. You, you you can't base something off just watching a couple kids do a good job all the time, right? So now, and even just being in the right spots and systems and all that, you're starting to see it now, and it's more fun for everybody. You know, I've had kids come to me that are like, "Oh, hockey's fun now," because again, I go, "Well, yeah, who has fun watching some kid just skate around with a puck?" Yeah, that's not fun for everyone, right? Yeah. So now, now it's coming to hockey. So now we're, you know, more intense. Like we're we're doing battle drills. And we're skating, and you know, just stuff that they've never done. You know, but it's 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 fun to be able to be that person that gets to like kind of give them this. That's so you hit some really good points there, and it's something I noticed first of all when I moved here to Hong Kong. Uh, I've been here for twelve years, and. Uh, part of the reason I, I got back into uh, refing and, and, and doing the podcast was because I started seeing all these things and I'm starting to piece it together. And uh, these kids are doing all the skill training. Like you said, yeah. private, private lessons, like private, that didn't even exist back home. No. Like a private, no. this is a team sport. Like you yeah. don't need a private lesson. Everybody's got to have a role. Like everyone needs to understand the different roles on a team. And it's just not understood and that's mm-hmm. like you said, the message you're trying to push to these kids. And and I noticed it in Thailand. Like I noticed you have a handful of really skilled players. Like I mean, mm-hmm. guys, guys that oh, could, yeah. could fit in in anywhere in the world. Yeah. Uh, there are guys here in Hong Kong, guys in Thailand that are that good. They have the skill. Mm-hmm. And then you see the he- the head go down when they oh, uh, yeah. when the when they when they miss a pass or or yeah. when somebody bumps them off the puck. Um yeah like the physical part of the game and, and, and not being, not talking like cross checking a guy in a face, yeah. just proper body checking and things like this. And, and I noticed yeah. that I noticed it amongst the, the local teams in Thailand that, and I noticed you actually um, taking a couple of kids aside when they came off the ice and they were pouting yeah, and just being like little sooks. And you're like, yeah. Oh. And they're the stars. Yeah. Like that's your yeah. best player. And he's soaking. Yeah. And it's yeah. like, those are the things like that's got to be, it's challenging, like you said, but really rewarding, yeah. really rewarding. But, in that. Yeah. And again, time. with that stuff too, right. It's like, you see yourself, like there's so many things, right? Like it's funny as a coach. Now you're just like, mm-hmm. uh, that just fires you up. And then you're just like, ah, I did that. Or you know what I mean? So like, that's why 
it's almost, you know, you, you made all the mistakes. You've done the good, you've done the bad though. So now when you're with these kids, you're able to be like, hey, no, that doesn't work. Like, right. you know, I know personally, like, don't act exactly. like this, don't be like this. Yeah. And, but again, it's having that person take you at that time and and you know hopefully they remember it and i mean i've had a lot of you know kids that didn't want to play or weren't happy with things and now oh we're coming you know they're coming back to the rink now the parents are happy and and again you know you're never going to get away from the parents stuff like that's life that's hockey yeah. but mm -hmm. but even that's like i'm like I'll, i have a meeting i'll have a meeting i talk with the parents where it's like you guys are going to enjoy hockey more if you understand like, yeah, absolutely. That it's okay that your kid's not scoring two goals a game. Like he's yeah. doing a really good job at what he's like, what I'm asking of him and what his role is on the team. He's doing an excellent job. So like, mm -hmm. just focus on that. And then like that, you know, that makes kind of the overall environment better. Yeah. Um, because again, right. You're with these people all the time. Like, it's not like hockey back home where you're playing all these different organizations and you're going on the road and you're, yeah, you know, you, you got to kind of use what you got. And, uh, you know, even to your point though, like we have some kids on the U18 and, you know, 14 big kids. And I'm like, I, my mindset is I want to train these kids. Like it would be amazing to like have one of these kids go to a professional trial one day. Yeah. You know, even, even like I said, I, I have old connections and your yeah, buddy's still coaching and to be able to say, Hey, I got this kid in Thailand, the first kid ever, like, Hey, bring him down to East coast training camp one time or something, yeah. you know, like for them to have that Jersey and that experience, like a kid from out here, like anything you never know. Right. Mm -hmm. But to be able to get these tournaments and international, like, I think it would be absolutely amazing. And, um, like I said, we, I, I, I have that mindset. So I'm coaching and, and training for that. I, yeah. I don't, I don't look at it like, Oh, I'm in Thailand. Right. Let's just, let's just, you know, we can make it. Okay. It's like, yeah. let's, let's make this as, as good as we can get. You, yeah. you never know. I, and again, yes. You know, not sitting here comparing saying you're playing gold Canada for gold <laughs> yeah. any, any year, but like, I mean, the, the, I always say, I want to give them the best opportunity that they possibly could ever have with hockey, you know, and, and that at the end of the day, however far they can take it and push it or how far they want to, it's like, I want them to be able to look back and be like, man, I learned more and, and was pushed and, and became better than I ever expected I could. And at the end of the day, that's, you know, that's kind of the goal for, for this whole thing. Perfect, man. Well said. Um, one of the things I mentioned, I wanted to mention too, is like these kids don't get to experience things like we did back home where you're going on road trips and going traveling with your teammates. Like yeah. if here in Hong Kong, like everyone shows up at the rink, which normally is in a shopping center. Everyone's coming from yeah. a different place, different schools. They're, they're not like a close knit group of, of friends mm -hmm. for the most part. And then they started uh, just before the pandemic, like the Greater Bay Area Hockey League here, which was like uh, South China and and Hong Kong together. And then the kids start like going to Shenzhen for a weekend together, yeah. staying in a hotel room, bonding yeah. as a group. Like these are the things that 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 I think are lacking. Oh, uh, that's. Here. I literally talked to a buddy about that like four days ago. Yeah, and um. Because, like, I mean, looking back, right? Like, you were 10 years old, I think, going already and staying yeah. in hotels, playing, you know, mini sticks in the hallways. Yeah. And, and, but again, you were like, it's like it was training you, programming you, like maybe the bus stalled, maybe something like the schedule, mm -hmm. right? Like, it got you out of that bubble yeah. and, and got you doing stuff. And I mean, especially here, like you had mentioned, like the rink before when I was first here, like, that was the big thing, right? Like the parents are with the kids, people are getting dressed and like, yeah, people are walking by. I'm like, this isn't like, you yeah. couldn't even build anything if you wanted to. Right. And mm -hmm. so that's the nice thing, obviously with the new rinks, like they actually have locker rooms and they're dressing together. They, I come in the room and the 
they got tunes playing and you know like it that that's the part i like and uh and that's that's kind of the direction that i'm hoping things can go and we can push things where um we can set up leagues we can set up stuff so we're able to travel again you know obviously with the yeah. covid stuff and, yeah. but like i i mention all the time like it would be fun again to me like i i'm i'm used to traveling and going places like i i enjoy it mm -hmm. um but it would be cool to take these again right that's one of my we were talking the other day like that Wee quebec tournament mm -hmm. you know like to be able to bring a team there one day or or the brick tournament in edmonton or you know even older age like to be able to expand and 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 let them experience that side of the hockey. Cause at the end yeah. of the day, like that's, that's the, uh, the culture thing again. Right. But it's yeah. like, that's the best part of it. And that's what makes the on ice really click is when you have that off ice stuff. Right. Yeah. hundred percent. And without it, but again, with the new rinks, like there is more of that community. So it's, it, it definitely is getting better in that sense, but mm -hmm. There's obviously so much like benefit with traveling and, you know, just, I think that's how you grow as people, you know, you got to get out and yeah. you got to, you got to build those rivals with other places or teams or countries. And, uh, you know, once, once even these kids experience, like, you know, maybe you go to Hong Kong and you're like, Oh, I, this kid thinks he's good. I'm better than him. You know, and now you have something yeah. to maybe work for a little bit. Right. 100%, yeah. When, when you're doing that training, you're like, Oh, you know, I got to play against that kid. I, you know, so it, it, it creates that instead of just like, you know, because you, you kind of build this rival amongst yourself, but then you're not allowed to get physical with each other. Right. So it's like, yeah. you have this built up and then it's, really all you can do is kind of verbally talk right because it's not a physical you it's not like back home you'd go fight for five minutes or something and yeah. move on with your life right so yeah. hopefully at some point we can we can build that so you know we can we can get some traveling involved and and get these kids out there and um you know go through that experience because like i said i mean that's that's one of the best parts of sports is being able to go yeah. on the road and, and go yeah. through all that that's everything. I mean, I talk to anyone who's retired. What do you miss most about the game? The locker yeah. room, the bus yeah. rides, the the For banter. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and also the one thing that's missing in a lot of these places, like in Bangkok, is you don't have hometown heroes. You don't have a guy who's played 10 years in the yeah. NHL. But things are changing, as you know. Yeah. Like there's been a couple of Thai guys uh drafted. Um, how 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 much do you see that changing in the future? Like how close are you guys, do you think, to having a couple guys that kids are going to start looking up to? Um, I think I, I don't think they, I don't think there's that understanding yet of, right. and, and again, right? Like, that's a big thing for me is, um, you know, I, when a coach has confidence in you, and kind of lays an option out for you. Like that goes such a long way. Mm -hmm. um, you know, just, it puts you in another gear, right? Mm -hmm. Because like, that's your guy and he's giving that to you, right? And I try and do that with like, even this tournament, you know, some of our top guys, I'll go to them like, hey, this is it. Like, you know, this is your moment. Like you be the leader, you guys step up, you take control, like, you know, and, and you're seeing, more i have to continually be on them about it mm -hmm. but it's there like the seed is planted and you know these guys they are understanding like you you have your guys right but again it's easy for those guys like anywhere to maybe get a little comfortable yeah because when you're the guy in a place like this it's easier to be the guy right without more people nipping at your heels every day mm -hmm. So kind of building that where those guys understand that, but then it get kind of gets everyone else going in that direction too. I I'm seeing more of it, which is, which is great. Um, guys are, like I said, guys are understanding more um, 
playing the game the right way is it, it makes more opportunity for everybody. Right. You know, like when you're playing hockey the right way, you can be a grinder, but still get scoring chances or something. Mm -hmm. If you're not, if you're just playing it, like however you want, well, it's not going to work. Right. So right. these kids are seeing that too. Like when I'm coaching them or we're doing drills, right. I mean, it's, it's like, like I said, with, with Sutter back in the day, when he said something to you, it's like, you couldn't really like talk back to him or, or like, yeah. what are you going to say to that guy? Right. You're yeah. a kid. You've never done anything yet. So you have that age group where they, they have that understanding. And I think appreciation, like, Hey, you're here giving us everything you have to make us better. So we have to do it. And I think that, you know, our certain age groups are doing that which is nice to see. And some of our young kids come up and practice with us. But again, the, the biggest issue is just the amount of options you have and what you have coming, right? You don't have that endless feeder system of mm -hmm. like, you know, you're not watching the practice before and like, Oh, I got eight kids coming for next, right. you know, you're like, okay, I got that kid and that kid. And hopefully that kid grows or hopefully that kid. Mm -hmm. So I mean, there, there's more of that, but, um, there's, there's more room, I guess, to be a, a top guy. Right. But then just with the numbers, there's, there's that kind of fall off and that that's where it gets a little difficult sometimes. Um, saving with practicing or something, you know, you, you have that kind of gap that maybe slows things down or, yeah you know, changes the flow of practice and mm -hmm. you have to find a way to kind of balance that and then keep the people that it's affecting more not to get too frustrated where it's causing an issue, right? So yeah. sometimes that's the challenge, but, you know, for the most part, these kids have pretty good attitudes and, and I mean, they're, they're working their butt off for me and, you know, they do what I ask. And like I said, I, I have to lose my voice a few times continually tell you, you know what it is. It's like when you're coaching, I'm actually just like, you're doing the, like, you're, you're telling playing. them the exact, like, Hey, puck here, 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 play yeah, the body, yeah. go here, yeah. chip the puck. Like you're, yeah. so they're getting it. So it's just like, you know, keep going until you can get to the point where I'm saying less and more is happening. That's yeah. kind of the that's kind of there's, the goal, right? There's so much truth to that because communication is such a huge part of the game. And and like you yeah. said, I I my only experience in Thailand was at the Land of Smiles tournament in November. And and I was impressed by a lot of things, but one of the things that I think you're gonna be able to rub off on is that communication because I can hear you on the bench. Yeah, yeah. I, like as, nobody if wanted, as if you're the player, like you're a, you're yeah. waiting for your next shift, right? And yeah. and these guys have to understand that communication is everything in the game oh, so dude, they 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 don't like so let's say in an eight month period it's like okay this weekend i heard four kids talk it's yeah. like <laughs> it's like right. oh, hey i heard you talking you know like yeah. it's 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 crazy like we'll be on we'll be doing out like but again right off ice stuff they were just sitting there before not saying anything. Now they're, you know, like not only the hockey, just as people. Right. Like I'm getting yeah. these, like these guys are becoming yeah. people. They're confident. They're talking. They're, they're laughing. They're having fun. And then we'll go do the off ice. We're playing soccer. They're playing give and goes. They're calling for the ball. They're driving the net. Right. And then you walk 500 feet and go on the ice. And it's like, it's like a library. Yeah. You know, and there's times where I'm just like, guys, yeah, you could literally hear like a pin fall on the ice right now. And again, just them under like the thing here is you have to just break things down more. So a lot of times you got to go back even in your mind, like, how do I break this down? And they're very visual people. And when you show them and then they do it, it's like, oh, okay okay and then and then it starts right. coming like i said like my u18 group i got probably half of them i mean they're communicating down low which yeah you know That's but big. still like yeah. they're standing at the point and like they'll get that 
pass from the forward and we'll get a shot, but like, they'll come to the bench. And I'm like, why did you get that pass? Cause I was yelling for it for yeah. you. Like right. if I'm not here, you're not getting that puck. That's what we got to get away from. Like you guys have to understand, like you got to do this together. And even now, like there's been a couple times where some guys will come off the ice and I see them talking about a shift or something. And I'm just like, yes, because this is what I'm telling them. Like you guys talk to each other, like yeah. come off the ice and be like, Oh man, I should have passed to that. Oh, I should have like, then mm -hmm. you guys understand or, you know, a face off go, Hey, stand here. Don't go here. Like you guys can do this. Yes. You guys are on ice together. Like I'm giving you the blueprint, but it's a read and react sport. Like mm -hmm. nothing's going to go just the way we say it's going to go. So yeah, right. this is where you guys come in and it's, it's really starting to come more and more. Um, the women's is, uh, a whole nother level they don't, they don't mind chatting but but it's like so fun because who they are you know like yeah you can't get mad at them some of them too oh, like I they're know. just looking at you and you're just like ah okay let's uh let's try this or this or this but yeah. again right so many of these kids and, and it's it's there like the want is there it's just they don't know no one's ever told them or showed them so yeah. it's like how would they know that's so right. that's the fun part for me but you know frustrating because you just want the best obviously for them and for them to get great but you got to remember that it's uh you know takes time for sure well man your passion for hockey just it's it's seeping from you and and I'm, those kids are really really lucky to have you um in their program and involved in their lives right now because uh, no, it's you. it's evident how much you care about the game and, and you care about the kids uh do you think it's something you'll stick with uh, do you have plans to stick around thailand for a while or what's the future hold for you yeah i mean it's one of those things that i mean especially thailand it's like you'll wake up and you'll be 50 one day and you'll still be here <laughs> it's yeah. just like the, you you forget the calendar here um mm -hmm. And it's, it's one of those things. It's just kind of, it's just going and it started and again. There's, there's always something kind of coming. And, um, you know, my dream is to, to make it as big as I can. And like I said, you know, get these kids as far as they can. I mean, to be able to go sit in the stands one day and watch someone that you helped out coaching, uh, you know, especially from a place like this, I mean, that would, that would be amazing. Um, so for me, I'd like to do it for sure, you know, definitely as, as long as I can. And, you know, obviously stuff pops up and mm -hmm. um, I think, it, you know, at some point I would love to try and coach, you know, back in the States or in Europe or, you know, even start low and work your way up a little bit or, you know, mm -hmm. playing. It would be really, I would really love to coach in a league that I was able to play in. Right. Um you know, I think that would obviously be a cool thing. And, yeah. um, you know, I look at just laughing, you know, my playing career was all over the place. It's like, who knows what the coaching yeah. career. <laughs> you might been. be in one place your whole career. Yeah. Maybe, maybe I'll be <laughs> in 30 or maybe I'll be in one, but That's right. uh, yeah, no, right. You know, it's, it's good. And it, like I said, it's, you know, it's kind of the beginning of things and, um, just in general, like it's Thailand, it's hockey, you know, you're kind of one of the first guys to, like there was no, this is the first time this rink was here. So yeah. it's, there's, there's a lot going on. There's, there's a lot more to come, but again, it's, it's in due time and there's obviously a lot of hurdles and, uh, you know, this is, uh, you know, like, you know, with anything there's behind the scenes stuff where there's a lot of stuff you got to go through and, mm -hmm. um, you know, frustrating stuff. It's, it's, it's far from, from easy, but, um, you know, I think the, with these kids, you know, that's the reward, right? So, you, you know, you put up with, with the grind and, and the tough stuff to, you know, give them the best opportunity to, and, and to see the, the, the sport grow, right? I mean, Thailand hockey, uh, <laughs> you know, that was a, that was kind of a mental pipe dream. I think it was one of those things you just thought of in the sense of, Oh, Thailand's cool. Hockey's awesome. That'd be a good mix, but you didn't actually really believe it. Right. I right. Mean, so 
to be here and, and start it, I mean, kind of the right way and, and be able to get it, I think, going in the right direction early. Um, I think there's a lot of potential. And uh, again, right, you, you never know. Uh, the game's different. The game's changed. Yeah. It, it's so I think, I think a lot of players that would have never even had a, a fraction of an opportunity now there is more hope for a lot of different players, you know, size wise and, and things like that. So, um, can't, can't count it out. Uh, you know, it'll, I, I might have some gray hair the next time we talk, uh, <laughs> by the time we, we get to that level of, uh, you know, the, the big name countries, but, uh, yeah, it's, it's definitely, uh, it's, it's going to be a, a process, but hopefully a really fun one. Well, I, for one, will be following that progress. Uh, I even watch, I even watch it on Facebook. You guys got the Thailand ice hockey federation. Yeah, yeah. You got live streaming games and I'm yeah. watching it once in a while. and just thinking this is crazy. Like I'm in, Hong, Man, they, Kong. They I'm do, in Hong Kong watching hockey in Thailand yeah. on, on Facebook. They, they do such an amazing job. Like my, my boss and his family and whole crew that does everything. I mean, they, they, they care, you know, they truly care. Like their kids are playing. Um, but like, yeah, like my boss, his family, they've, they've treated me like family. They've, they've been amazing. Um, the kids are great. Uh, you know, they're, they're good people. They make you want to give that effort and make it as good as can be because, you know, you see all the effort they're putting in. I mean, mm -hmm. we joked about before how there's just constantly tournaments, but you know, they do the jerseys, the medals, the trophies, like it's, they never do anything like 50%. It's yeah. always, they do it the right way. So, um, you know, you definitely have good people um, that again, right. There's always federations, there's difficulties, there's people that have to go around. There's, you know, in these countries, nothing runs smoothly, but um, with, without this, this group that's running everything um you know none of this would be possible i mean he's built two rinks uh we got another one coming in chiang mai um so you know at the end of the day without without him yeah not this is impossible right so um like i said some 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 good people that that are in place to to move things forward so and you know, even just with these tournaments, making some contacts and relationships, yeah. you know, Greg talking with him in, in Hong Kong about the Asian super, you know, just yeah. there's moving parts now. So, yeah. and, and it's cool, you know, when you have another a Canadian or American or someone that, you know, yeah. when you sit down and have a meeting, you guys are, you're on the same page. You, you both been through Mm -hmm. that side of it and you've also dealt with like the asian side of how they kind of handle things so you know the more people in these countries that we can get kind of on board to to get this stuff set up i mean there's there's a lot of a lot of possibilities and potential i think for sure sky's the limit over here i've been saying that for a few years now and meeting guys like you and gary tan in malaysia and yeah. You know, Chris Wakabayashi in Japan and guys who have been through it, like you said, and we're over here just doing God's work and, and sh just sh spreading the love of hockey around the world. It's an incredible thing to see. Um, I've taken a lot of your time tonight, Rory, but before I let you go, uh, I have a final segment called Overtime, where I'm going to ask you a few one-timer questions, just rapid fire questions. And you say, the first, right. you say the first thing that comes to mind. Okay. All right. All right. Here we go. Habs or Leafs? Leafs. Lemieux or Gretzky? Lemieux. Probert or Domi? Domi. Wah or Brodeur? Wah. Orr or Lidstrom? Oh. I, I love Orr, but I got to go Lidstrom. Okay. Claude Lemieux or Brad Marchand? Marchand. Iserman or Mess? Messier. Bowman I, or... Okay. Yeah, Mess. Yes. Bowman or Burns? Burns. Ron or Don? Oh, Don. Love Don. Shootout or no shootout? Uh, no shootout. Now, it was cool before. Okay. All right. One final question for you, Rory. Uh, if you could trade all your years of pro hockey 
for one full season in the NHL, would you do it? What's the contract? <laughs> it 80, 82 games, full season, no injuries. What's the salary? League minimum. <laughs> no <laughs> signing bonus. I, dude, that's a tough question. But I knew it would be. That's a that's a real tough question. That's a real tough question. I think I think I'd have to take my my career because uh, one one year on that salary, I don't think who knows what would happen <laughs> to be. <laughs> awesome, man! Thank you so much. Uh, appreciate you uh, giving me your time, and I also appreciate everything that you're doing to to help grow the game over here. It's tremendous, and I look forward to following you in the future. Thanks a lot, man. I appreciate you having me on here, and uh, thanks like for you too for for what you're doing and you know, getting in touch with guys like this and, uh, you know, shows your passion for the game too. So yeah. um, without, you know, people like you and, uh, you know, caring about guys like me and what we've done, you know, this stuff wouldn't happen. So, um, you know, you're a huge part and, you know, you guys that do these podcasts and, and get the word out there, it's, you know, it's, it's huge for us too and for the game. So appreciate what you do as well. Absolutely. My pleasure. Thanks Roy. Right, uh, have a great, have a great rest of your season and uh, I'll be in touch. Sounds good, man. All right. That was Across the Pond, and that's a wrap. Thank you, thank you, thank you to our amazing sponsors, the China Hockey Group, Wheel Hub Asia, AccessoryHouseGlobal.com, Yardley Brothers Beer, and of course, Sunset Studio. Check us out on Facebook and Instagram at Across the Pond HK. Email us, send in your comments and questions to the show at any time at acrossthepondhk at gmail.com.